should have brought us donuts. Oh, that's right. There's no donuts today because the TV boppers are gone. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I have the answer to that problem. Can anybody hear me okay? Do, we need, do I need a microphone? I, I, Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. I get it. Okay. All right. Well, last week, I guess, uh, we'll start with prayer request. Dear God, I thank you. We pray for a safe, uh, a safe trip for the the prices and, and the teenagers. We pray that you'll work in their, work in them as they're over at the ranch and, and make them to make decisions that will be Christ honoring and will and will and will aid them in the rest of their lives. And uh, Lord, help us here today to give us give us a good Sunday school time and give us a good lesson and help us to take what your word says and apply it to our own lives for the better as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, last week we talked about, um, we were in the book of Judges. I didn't really have an outline, so I had to make my own up. So um, it might be a little off the track, but I think it'll be pretty useful. Oh, good morning. I think it'll be pretty useful. We're going to be in Judges chapter 10. Okay. Last week we were in Judges chapter, I believe, 8 and 9. We're talking about Abimelech and the atrocious acts that he committed and tried to kill 70 of his brothers. And he failed. He only got 69 of them. And then, anyway remember all that, but this, this week we're going to talk about Judges chapter 10, which is additional declensions, that is additional um, times when they turned around and did evil after God delivered them, and then if we got time, we'll go to chapter 11, we'll talk a little bit about Jephthah and what he did. Really, Jephthah was actually a very strong leader, a very decent man, actually, and then he just made a really horrible vow, which was totally unnecessary to make, and anyway, if we got time to talk about that, we will a little bit today. But anyway, let's start with chapter, chapter, Judges chapter 10, uh, verse, let's see, let's, we'll read the first, uh, let me say it here, let's read the first six verses, I don't have an, I don't have a handout, so if you, if you want to, yeah, if you want an outline, just take notes here, the first title I have is, Tolager and the Sixth Apostasy, so here we are, first, chapter 10, verse 1 through 6, I'll read it here, starting, uh, it goes, just, it goes uh, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, in case you don't know where Judges in the, is in your Bible. Okay, chapter 1. And after Abimelech, there arose to defend Israel Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he dwelt in Shamir in Mount Ephraim. And he judged Israel twenty and three years and died and was buried in Shamir. And after him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel twenty and two years, and he had thirty sons that rode on thirty ascolts, and they had thirty cities. So thirty is the magic number here which are called Havoth Jair unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Taman. And here we go. This is the verse I want to focus on. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam and Ashtoreth, and the gods of the Assyria, the gods of Zidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and forsook the Lord and served not him. Okay, so how many times then, for those of you that have been studying Judges for the last several weeks, how many times then, have the children of Israel turned around and did evil when they were supposed to do right up to this, including this time, including these two times. How many times was it in the whole book of Judges up through verse chapters 1 through 10? Anybody know? Pretty much every chapter. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much every chapter. The I think it's six, actually, because some of the, some of the, uh, some of the, uh, some of the accounts go several chapters. That's true, yeah. Like the account of Samson is several chapters. The account of the Limphilolek is two chapters, I believe, and others. Six times. And uh, I don't know how many years. I mean, the judges, the, the period of the judges is about 450 years, and we're not quite halfway through the book here, so this is about six times in a span of 200 years. Good morning, Andrew. Judges chapter 10. You look nice. I like that. Anyway, so this time... God has delivered him all those times, but now this is what God's going to do. Let's read chapter 7 through 10 here. Anybody, anybody want to read it? Where are we going to be in? Judges chapter 10, maybe 11 if we've got time. We'll talk a little bit about our, my good friend Thanks, Jephthah yeah. if we've got time. But t first we're talking about just, uh, we're in chapter 10, verse 1 through 6. It's talking about Israel had a couple different new judges after Abimelech's rise and fall, and they turned around and did evil again. So here, well, I'll start in chapter 7 here. This time, though, and, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of the Philistines and into the hands of the children of Ammon. And that year they vexed 
and oppressed the children of Israel. Eighteen years, and the children of Israel that were on the other side of Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is Gilead. Moreover, the children of Ammon passed over Jordan to fight against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was sore distressed. Uh, so they first came to, um, first they were on one side, Jordan, that is the Ammonites, then they came to the other side, Jordan. So the, the, Israel lost their freedom here because now the people that hate them are going to rule over them as uh, punishment for their sin. And reading on here, and the children of Israel cried, here in chapter verse 10 here. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also have served Balaam. Now, I read what the Lord says here in verse 11. This is what we're going to kind of focus on in this chapter here for a bit. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did not I deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites, from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines? The Zidonians also and, and the Amalekites and the Maonites did oppress you, and you cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand. Yet ye have forsaken me and served other gods. Wherefore will I deliver you no more? So God is finally saying, you're not going to be delivered this time. I'm done. I'm tired of this. This has gone on six times for the, whatever, 200 so years. This, has gone, this is the sixth time. I'm not going to do it again. We're not going to do it the seventh time, he's saying. Go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen. And let them deliver you in the time of your tribulation. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about this a minute here. Let's, let's uh, sort of expand on this theme here a little bit. Uh, where are my notes here? Because here God's reminding them of what happened in Egypt, at the Amorites, the Philistines, all these people, he, all these nations that he delivered them from in the past, and he's saying no more. So let's, let's, let's look at some other scriptures here and see what this kind of means to us today. Um, let's go to Deuteronomy 32, 15. I believe that's the right one. Wait a minute. I think that's the right one. Deuteronomy is the fourth book. I believe it's two books in front of Judges. Fifth book or fourth book? I don't remember. Fifth, fourth. Fifth, yeah, fifth. Anyway. 3215. I'll, I'll, I'll solicit a volunteer to read it. I'll take it. All right. But Joshua waxed fat and kicked. Thou art waxed and fat. Thou art grown thick. Thou art covered with fatness. Then he forsook the God which made him and lightly esteem the rock of his salvation. Yeah, that's exactly what they were doing. They were lightly esteeming the rock of their salvation. And this is, did anybody know what the context of this passage in Deuteronomy is? It's actually the, um, sort of the tale. Song of, it's the Song of Moses. Yeah, it's the, kind of the tail end of it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Good. You know the Bible pretty well. And uh, they, they, the key, they, they lightly esteem the rock of their salvation. And... Um, that's, that's why they, and they were doing that the entire time through the history of the judges, too. They, that's, what they, that's pretty much what they've always done. They lightly esteemed the rock of their salvation. That's God. They, put, they, they didn't care about Isn't God. Isn't that kind of the history of mankind in general? Yeah, I'd say so. I'd say so. But we want to we want to kind of apply that to us, those, us that are saved. Is it possible for someone who's saved to do this? Sure. Sure is. We're going to expand on it a little more. Okay, Proverbs chapter, 20, cha Proverbs chapter 1, starting at verse 20. Hold your pace and judges. We're going to come back there. And there's several Proverbs. I think Pastor Christ taught on that a couple weeks, Sundays ago. It's Proverbs, I believe, chapter 9 has similar similar theme to Proverbs chapter 1. It's about wisdom in the streets, crying. And uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20. I'll read it real quick here. You can feel free to interrupt me, by the way. Go ahead, Mrs. Dollins. No, I was going to ask if I could read it. Okay. Oh. Yeah, just read the first verse of it. Proverbs chapter one, verse Proverbs chapter one, verse twenty. Wisdom crieth without; she uttereth her voice in the streets. And we're going to read the rest of a bit of a lengthy passage in a minute. One comment I'd like to make about this verse, though, is this is kind of like what you are when you go soul winning, out in the streets. Uh, you're telling people about Christ. You're presenting Christ. You're preaching Christ out in the streets. That's sort of the personification of wisdom. Crying without, without means outside of. So, like the Levitical priests. In, the, in ancient Israel, had their, part of their duties was to go without the camp and seek the lepers, not the other way around. It wasn't the le lepers seeking the priests, it was the priests seeking the lepers. And of course, that's the personification of Christ and his work of uh, reconciliation. It's a, just, that's not, it's a little off the topic, but I just thought it was interesting. Uh, okay. I'll get the rest of it here. She crieth in the chief places of concourse in the opening of the gates. In the city she uttered her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity, and the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge? Turn you in my reproof, 
Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, and I will make known unto you, I will make my words known unto you. That's always pretty pretty much God's pleading to pretty much Israel and pretty much the whole world. How are you doing, Mike? Uh, verse 24, because I have called. Now this is sort of this is sort of a parallel to what was happening in Judges here, starting at verse 24. Behold, I have called and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But he have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. That's exactly what they were doing all that time. I also, now here's what God was saying in uh, Judges chapter uh, 10, verse um, 13 and 14. That's similar to what he's saying here. But ye have said not, verse, verse 25, but ye have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity and will mock at your fear. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh is desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall you call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, and they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would none of my counsel and despise all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with the, their own devices, for the turning away the simple shall slay them, and the prosperative fools shall destroy them. So that's that's a pretty par I think that's a good parallel to what we're seeing in Judges and also in Kings and Chronicles and even some Christians actually can so even someone who's saved today and we're going to have a couple New Testament examples here in a second of, of that sort of thing. Um, but that's I think it's a very interesting parallel right there. Uh, where was I? So what does that mean to us today? Is it possible for believers in the church age to to, to take a similar course? So. Yeah, it sure is. We're going to see a couple examples here in a second. Where was I? No, I can't read my own handwriting. That's pretty pathetic when you can't read your own handwriting. You know, when I was in the fifth grade, this, this teacher actually, I don't know what, I don't know where they got this idea from. I was a left-hander, so they actually had this they had this metal brace that some dreamboat invented, and they had those of us who had, who were having trouble with handwriting legibility wear this brace so we could write a little more legibly. It didn't do any good though. Anyway, I'm a little off the topic, sorry. <laughs> I don't think they try that now in school. Okay, what is real? Okay. Now, a couple New Testament examples of believers who are not living for God and who are following the similar course of the judges. And I think that's, remember, judges was not written to us, but it was written for us. Any, any scripture was written for us. And we're going to talk about that in a second. 1 Corinthians 5.1. Hold your places and hold your place in judges again. First Corinthians five one. Here is an example from the New Testament. Of course, Corinth, I believe, was a church that had a lot of problems. <coughs> and there's a lot of churches. Well, I mean, there's a, there's churches in this country. There's churches in this city. I think that have similar problems. We really don't have any glaring problems here like this, but, there, but it's possible. You could, I mean, when, you, when you're a soul-winning church, you get all kinds of people in here. And some of them, not everybody grows and, and progresses at the same rate. So anyway, here's, an, here's a New Testament example of, uh, some, I, I think, of something that's parallel to what we're reading about in the Judges here. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. And maybe stop it. I guess stop at 3. Anybody want to read it? All right. Okay, just the Thank one you. verse or go down to three? Yeah, just go, yeah, one to three, that'd be, that'd be okay. great. Okay. It is reported commonly, commonly, that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, and absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that hath done, done, yeah, hath so done this deed. Yeah. yeah. So that's uh, I think that's a that's a pretty good parallel to what uh, that sort of thing. What when you when you go off a whoring after other gods, this sort of thing goes along with it, mm -hmm. and that's what this who this person. I don't know who he was. I would surmise that this. Says he had one. It's, he should have his father's wife. I would surmise that that was not his mother. It was probably maybe his father had multiple wives, something like that. I don't know. But even the Gentiles weren't weren't doing that. 
but that yet this man was in the church. He was saved. And if you read this whole passage, we don't, we're not going to read this whole passage here, but if you read this, this guy was saved. And it doesn't say anywhere in the scripture that he lost his salvation or he was cast out or anything like that. He just says he was saved. And why, why was this being tolerated? Well, because the people, it wasn't just him. It was the whole people. They were all puffed up. What does puffed up mean? Arrogant. Hmm? Arrogant. Yeah, arrogant. Full of yourself. Like a, you ever see a, like a, one of those rubber surgical gloves and you blow it up like a balloon? Kind of like that. You've probably seen people do that. Stacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, the, the people were puffed up and they did not mourn. That this, they, weren't, they weren't sorry about it. They, nope. They just kind of said, thought, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure exactly what they were thinking. I wasn't there, but it was being tolerated. It was being tolerated just like whatever was going on in the time of the judges was being tolerated. And uh, further on in this, this, same, this same epistle, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 11, I think gives us a lot more light on it as well. So it's a lengthy passage. Anybody want to try it? Or I, I'll, I can Where are we at? Right, I'm going, going to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 through 11. I'll, I'll take it if you want. All right, go for All it. All right. Uh, moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed in the sea. And all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things they also lusted. Not to be idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed as serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Mm -hmm. Now all these things happen unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our ammunition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Yeah, exactly. There, uh, thank you. These are, um, so anything, any of these things in the Old Testament, Judges, or the Chronicles, or Kings, any of these, any of these things we're reading there, they're examples for us today. Because they all actually... They drank of the same spiritual rock and followed. They, they drank, what is it saying? They ate of the same spiritual meat. They drank in, of the same spiritual drink and the same spiritual rock that was Christ. So they were saved. I, get, I, I, I used to wonder how people were saved in the Old Testament. Actually, they were saved the same. I suppose it's the same as now, just by the blood of Christ washing away their sins. It's just back then, it was a future event. Now it's a past event. Uh, anyway, so that, that's... Uh, it was written because it's possible for Christians but today in the church age to follow the same path as them. So we need to, we need to as it says in, also in chapter 10, verse 12 here, let, for let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. So this could, this could be us. We, we could have people that are committing fornication. We could have idolatry, <coughs> murmuring. Murmuring is kind of a big one. People complaining, you know, it's God's fault. I've done this. I'll be honest with you guys. I've done it. It's God's fault that thus and such happened. God's fault. It's God's fault that some bad thing happened. It's God's fault I didn't get my way about something. I think that's a big one, actually. I think that's probably a more serious one. That's probably a more common one than the, any of the others here, actually. Tempting Christ. You're provoking him. Uh, you know, we've, believers today can and have practiced fallen into this thing. So, um, so what's the answer? What's that mean? What does all this mean to us today? You can talk about the judges, or you can talk about what happened in the judges, you know, several, I don't know, when did the judges, when was that, like 1,000 B.C., a little earlier, 1,200 B.C.? Yeah, about then, 1,200 B.C. You can talk about something that happened in 1,200 B.C., but it is relevant for us today. We need to be living for Christ. We need to be living for God. We need to not, we need to be doing the things we're supposed to do. And it's really pretty simple. We all know what we're supposed to do. Just Go to church, join a church, you know, tell others about Christ, live a holy life. We're talking about it a lot in our sermons lately. So, uh, anyway, anybody have any comments, any questions, anything? We're not done yet. We can go a little long. We got more material. But... Okay. Very nice. Um, what was I going to say now? 
Okay, well, let's talk about something else here. So God is saying to these people that he's not going to deliver them now. So going back to Judges chapter 10, what do we see? Verse 14, go and cry unto the gods which ye have chosen, and let them deliver let them deliver you in the time of your tribulations. But God's saying to Israel at this point, how you doing, Tony? Um, we're in Judges chapter 10. Good morning. Okay, so verse 15 here. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. Do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. And they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. And his soul, who's his there? God. His soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Let's stop right there. God's, God's so good that even if after the way you may have mistreated him or, or despised him or tossed him aside or threw or just turned your back on him some way, he still will be grieved for your misery. We're moving on here. Then the children of Ammon <coughs> were gathered together and encamped in Gilead, and the children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mizpah, and the people and princes of Gilead said one to another, What man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead, and of course that man will be... Yeah, Jephthah, but we'll talk about him in a minute here if we got time. We should have a little time, actually. It's only 1025. Um, so let's talk about this here. God at first said he's not going to deliver again. He said, if you push me too far, it's gone too long. Am I on Facebook Live? No. Okay. Uh, where was I? God says, no, you, you've gone too far. We've done this six times. This, we're not going to deliver you the seventh time. But they had prayed to God, I think perhaps sort of as maybe a last final plea with God. And they were really, this time they really meant it, and they actually put away the false gods. And, they, and God, what did he do? He was, grieved for their, he was grieved for their misery. So uh, let's look at a couple of parallel passages here. Why did God, after he said he's not going to deliver him, why did he later, he, and of course you read the rest of the, you read the next chapter, he, they do get delivered. So why did God say he's not going to deliver them and then go ahead then deliver them later? That's the nature. It's, it's yeah. possible. Let's look at a couple of passages here. Let me see if I can read my handwriting. They repented, actually. Go ahead. They, they, they repented first. They put away... Yeah, that's right. Their, um, their, basically their gods, and then they, they actually turned back. So, like, they... I guess in a sense they proved themselves. He yeah, knows their heart. Right. Yeah, that, that's, there's some truth to that. Yeah, there's some truth to that. Okay, let's look. At, let's talk about God's mercy for a minute. Let's talk about mercy for a minute. Uh, Micah, there's a book everybody reads all the time, right? Micah, seven eighteen. I actually was reading in Micah recently. That's where I came across this. I try to have a sort of a regimen where I read the whole Bible in about a year. It's about five or six chapters a day, if you can if you can discipline yourself to make time for that. Sometimes I actually make it. Okay. Micah 7, 18. Now this the context here is, is uh, it's talking about God's pardon and love. And of course Micah is talking about there, there's some prophecy in Micah about the coming millennial kingdom. There's some also some prophecy about what's going on then as punishment for sins. But here's the very last chapter of Micah. And he's talking about. This, this, this passage talks a good bit about the nature of God. Verse 18, we'll just read one verse. Anyone want to try it? All right, Miss Dollar. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. 18? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Micah 7, 18. Yes, ma'am. Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He delighteth in mercy. Thank you, ma'am. He delighteth in mercy. Now, God does not just say, yes, I'll be merciful because, you know, frankly, people need it. No, he does, that's not a mercy. something he delights in. Mercy is one of his favorite things, actually. He loves it. It's not just a matter of, I'll do it because I have to. Because, well, because frankly, we do need it. But that's the nature of God. He loves, he loves to be merciful. He loves it. And that's one of the reasons I think he, that's one of the reasons, probably if not the chief reason, why he showed mercy to Israel in J Judges chapter 10 and why he's done it for me. Many, honestly, there's a lot of times when I should have been wiped out. 
just for the an attitude I had or something I was doing or I, I don't want to elaborate on it, but there's a lot of times I should have been wiped out. God would have been right to just wipe me out, but He didn't. I remember one. I, I remember a couple times standing and saying, "But what did I just say? Uh, why am I still standing here?" You know, well, that's just God's mercy. That's just God's mercy. Uh, Psalms 106:43. Keep that in mind, you know, don't, if you blow it with God, if, keep short accounts, we usually use this as an expression, I haven't heard this in a while, but keep short accounts with God. If you did something, you sinned in some way, get right, get, do it as soon as possible. Don't let it fester. Because, you know, God often, you know, God doesn't usually have to, he has not, you know, we, there's some passages in Hebrews about God's chastising and punishing and such. I haven't really been chastised and punished that often, honestly. Because I've, well, honestly, it's because I've always come back and said, God, please, I, I, I want to get right with you. You do that, do it again and again and again and again. That's what you got to do. You don't have to get saved all over again. You just have to get right all over again. Sort of like a daily cleansing. Anyway, that's another topic for another Sunday school. But uh, Psalm 106, 43. Okay. Many right. times, many, many times did he deliver them, but they provoked him with their counsel and were brought low for their iniquity. 44, I think, would go well as well. Yeah, that's kind that of really, yeah. Really, 43, 40, 43 through 45. I'm sorry. Oh, never mind. Sure. Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry, and he remembered them for his them his covenant, and repented according to the multitude of his mercies. Yeah. Amen. Does God repent? Is it necessary for God to repent? It says here that he has. It says here that he repented. That's another topic. I know it's a long yeah, topic, but, but, yeah, but, but, but that just means that I guess it means that he changed that God changed the direction he was going to go in with them. He was going to punish them severely, but then they they came to him and he said, "Okay, all right, I won't." With, uh, so that's just further evidence God loves to be merciful to people. God, yeah, he and he does it all the time. Okay, let's say you're saved today and you've sinned. What should you do? Let's say you're saved and you've gone down a wrong path, maybe for a good long time. What should you do? Well, let's turn to First John one, two. <coughs> I actually memorized this passage once. First John one, wait a minute. First John. 2, 1, sorry. Here, I'll get it. I'll get it. Okay, 1 John 2, 1. For my little children, these things that write I unto you that ye sin not. So let's stop right there. If, uh, now this, there's some teachings going on. I don't hear it very often, but I have. They're saying that if a Christian, some people, some uh, churches, some circles say that Christians achieve sinless perfection. Well, if that were the case, John would not have said, these things are right unto you that you sin not. He's writing, he's telling you to sin not because you can sin. Anyway, and if any man sin, we have an advocate. What's an advocate? The lawyer, the, uh... Yeah, somebody who pleads your case. That's what it is. With the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus Christ is your advocate. If you're saved, Jesus Christ is your advocate. No matter what you do. If you've sinned or done something really, I mean, you could do something really horrible. This this grace is available to someone who could be who's committed mass. This this is available to someone who's committed horrible, murderous crimes like Jeffrey Dahmer, who actually who he became a believer while he was in jail. Then he was killed by some other prisoner. Uh, advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So whatever you've done, you can come to come to Christ as your advocate, get right with him, and then then you can move on from it, and then then start on the path you need to be on. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So it's, he's potentially the savior of all mankind. He died for everybody's sins. Every, so don't, don't let it go in vain. Don't let this advocacy go in vain. Come to him. Use it. Don't go lengths of long time without in being in a state of not being in, in, in fellowship with God. Use, you have the resources. God's done everything for you. You just need to, you just need to come to him and use it. 
And that's what Israel finally did after they, you know, we both, you talked about six, going back to Judges here, you're going about six times here. In chapter 10, it was the sixth time that they fell away. But yet God still, after, even after he said he was not going to deliver them, he repented himself and he did. And Jephthah was raised up, which we're going to, we got about 10 minutes, we'll talk a little about Jephthah. Any, any questions, any comments before we go talk about Jephthah? My good friend Jephthah? Who had a so about Jephthah is uh, now the last okay well the last chapter the last verse of t chapter ten the people were saying and the princes of Gilead said one to another what man is he that will begin to fight against the children of Ammon he shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead well that man would be Jephthah as we'll read in the following chapter here chapter eleven verse one I'll start here for Jephthah the Gilead now Jephthah I'm saying his name right. The Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of an harlot, and Gilead begat Jephthah. Jephthah was the son of a harlot. He was an illegitimate child. That, now, was that his fault? No. But, well, he still had to bear some shame for it, even though that wasn't his fault, as you'll read in ch chapter verse 2 here. And Gilead's wife bare him sons, this Gilead, I guess it was his dad. And his wife's sons grew up, and they thrust out Jephthah, and said unto him, Thou shalt not inherit in our father's house, for thou art the son of a strange woman. It's a pretty lousy way to treat somebody. That wasn't, wasn't his fault. He was the son of a strange woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brethren. Well, you know, be careful how you treat people, by the way. Don't treat somebody like that because of, the, because of their upbringing, because of where they're from, or because they're in a bad home or something. Don't, don't treat people like that. If you're saved, don't treat people that way. If somebody comes in here, and he's dressed in rags, and maybe you can smell alcohol, maybe his breath smells like a distillery. You know, don't, don't treat him like this. I don't care who they are, don't treat people like that. It's not right. And uh, you will tempt people to do what Jephthah did here, which is to, uh, and Jephthah fled from his brethren, verse, verse 3, and dwelt in the land of Tob, 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 I don't know how to say that. And there were gathered vain men to Jephthah and went out with him. Now I've seen this kind of happen with other Christians, by the way. They're, they're in a church and they're treated badly, or something, or they're some kind of way. So they're treated in a similar manner to what we just read here. So what do they do? And I've kind of done this myself a little bit. You get mad, and you go, and you leave, and you go gather with vain men. And that's what Jephthah did. Well, what good are these vain men ever doing? Zero. What do you, you just cast out by his own family for something that was not his fault, something he didn't do. He had nothing to do with, who, with what was going on between his mother and his father. It wasn't his fault. But he was cast out anyway, and so I suppose in his desperation, perhaps in his anger, I don't know exactly all his motives for doing this, but he gathered with vain men. So, that's the, so be careful how you treat people, if you get nothing else out of this. Um, keep reading here. And it came to pass in process of time that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. And it was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, and we're not going to get through the whole chapter 11, by the way, but we'll go as far as we can. And the elders of Gilead with, went to fetch Jephthah out of the land of Tob, 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 I guess it is, and they said to Jephthah, Come and be our captain, and we may fight with the children of Ammon. And uh, keep reading here. And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, Did not ye hate me and expel me out of my father's house? And why are ye come now, come unto me now when you are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, Therefore are we... Therefore we turn again to thee now, that thou mayest go with us and fight against the children of Ammon, and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Now here's this interesting parallel between Jephthah and the Lord Jesus Christ. The, um, let's look, I wrote it. Go to Psalm 118.22. Everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. The, the microphone's a little distracting, I don't know why, it's just... Okay. You, could have a half you, project, you project pretty well anyway. Yeah, okay. Well, that's, that's good to know. Thanks. Psalm 118, 22. Pretty famous verse, actually. You sure I'm not Facebook Live? Go ahead. Psalm 118, 22. Anybody want to? You got it, Andrew? I don't know. Oh, and I, yeah. now I have it. Okay. Oh, yeah, I, I should know this one. The stone which the builders refused, 
it's become the headstone of the corner. That's yeah, and it's, it's also been you can find essentially the same verse in Mark 12 and, and the other Gospels as well. Interesting parallel between Christ and Jephthah here. Jephthah was rejected and cast out. Now they're calling him back to become his, their head. Whereas Christ was rejected and cast out, and he would then become the head of the corner. And of course, those who rejected Christ will be what? Ground to the, the stone will ground, grind them to powder. Those who rejected Christ and obeyed not the gospel will be ground to powder. And those that, to those that do believe, Christ is precious, and you'll get to reign with him in a thousand year reign and then all through eternity. Interesting parallel here. Uh, anyway, where were we? And Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, Did you not? Okay, Jephthah. 11.8, and the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, therefore we, well, make that 11.9, and Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, if you bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and the Lord deliver them before me, shall I be your head? And the elders of Gilead said unto Jephthah, the Lord be witness between us, if we do not so according to thy words. And Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. And then Jephthah sent messengers, of course, to the king of the children of Ammon, rather lengthy passage here about Jephthah's diplomacy. He was actually very skilled in, in dealing with the enemies. He wrote them letters, and if you'll read this whole passage, you can see that the, uh, the, the king of Ammon was claiming that Israel basically stole their land. It's kind of similar, it's a lot of similarities between the claims that the Palestinians are making today in the Holy Land. It's just flat out ridiculous. And Jephthah reminds them of what of Jephthah knew history. He knew history very well, and he, he tells this king. We don't have time to read the whole passage here. We only got five minutes. He tells this king of Ammon all that was all that had happened when the children of Israel wished to make passage after they came out of Egypt. They were refused by several kings. Let me see. I wrote them down here. Refused by uh, Edom, uh, several other kingdoms. And then, then they got the gall. They were they refused Israel passage in the land. They had to stay out and go around. And then now they got the gall to sit here and say, "This is our land. Israel stole it from us." Well, that was rubbish. And Jephthah plainly told him in these letters between these that he sent to these kings that that was rubbish. That's a lie. Israel did not wrong you. We did not steal your land. Just the way he represented his, just the way he, the brilliant way he represented his country. It kind of sounds like Donald Trump, right? But, <laughs> sorry, couldn't resist. But actually, it kind of was a little bit. Donald Trump's kind of a... I'm not really a big fan of his, but I like what he's doing as president. I never really was a big fan of his. I thought his TV shows were rubbish. But, they were. Yeah, but as president, he's, I, I, I do like the fact that he is actually trying to put, put the interest of this country at best. And Jephthah did a very similar thing in Israel. He said, these guys are lying. They're lying about why they're making war with Israel. Now, of course, there, Ammon, was allowed to make, Ammon was making war like this because God allowed him to because of the sins of the Israelites. But they're making up these ridiculous, ex phony excuses saying that Israel stole their land, which was garbage. And Jephthah plainly told him that. And, of course, you read the rest of this chapter, Jephthah will, Jephthah will go on and defeat them, and he will make an awful vow, which we're not going to have time to really get into, the vow of Jephthah. But what you, anyway, let's see if we can read a little bit of it. We've got five minutes left, or three minutes left. So Jephthah was a good example of, of uh, somebody we should maybe live after. I mean, minus the vow part. Uh, I'll say a little bit about Jephthah's vow here without really getting into great detail about it. Maybe that would have to be next week's lesson, perhaps, uh, if Charlie wants to do it that way. Sometimes I think vows are made that aren't necessary to make. Sometimes, for example, the example we cited in Corinthians just earlier in this lesson today about the man who was committing fornication with, he was having his father, one of his father's wives, perhaps. Uh, he didn't really need to make a vow about getting right with God about it. All he had to do was just get right with God about it. He didn't need to turn that into a vow. And I think a lot of times, here's an example of a vow that I made. Not a real serious one. It's kind of a one out of when I was a little feeling a little desperate. I was working for this guy. I had this, there's, there's a company that was doing some aviation training down in Miami. They were doing a contract work with the Pan Am Academy down on Northwest 36th Street. So this guy was not a very good business manager, so about a week and a half into working for him, he loses the contract because he got into an argument with him. Long story short, I didn't get paid for a week and a half. And a week and a half worth of work there, I guess, was about 1500 bucks. Okay, well, yeah, that's, that's money. It's money that I earn. So I said to God about it, I said, God, and this is, this is a silly thing for me to say, and I'm glad that it didn't get answered actually now. 
It's like I really wanted the money. I mean, I wasn't that desperate. I was living at Chris's house at the time with Charlie and Chris. And uh, so I wasn't desperate for money. I wasn't desperate. I mean, so I said, God, you know what? If I, if you, if you make this guy to pay me what he owes me, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tithe on it. I'll, I'll give, I'll give a good, big bit of it to the church. Well, I never got. He never paid me. This guy never saw his face again. But I'm kind of glad because it wasn't necessary to make a vow out of something like that. If you want to give, if you want to be a giver, if you want to be the giver that God wants you to be, just, just, just do it. Do it with simplicity. You say, yes, I want God, to, you know, say, God, make me the cheerful giver I'm supposed to be. I, and I'll, you don't, make a, you don't even make a vow out of that. Just do it. And also about Jephthah's vow, he, I guess, I believe God would have let him out of it. Of course, we're not, we're not getting into all the detail about it here because we're running out of time here. But concerning Jephthah's vow, because that vow, I, that's kind of desperate plea I made there. You know, it wasn't necessary. I don't need to do that. Just keep things simple. You know, if, if you want to give, just give. You don't have to make a deal like that. Anyway, I'm not saying God won't make ever make deals with people, but it wasn't necessary. And this vow, Jephthah, if you read on the rest of this passage, you'll see that I believe God would have just let him out of it. I don't think God really would have forced him to go along and, and continue to uh, keep that promise. I guess maybe, I don't want to say too much about it because I don't want to confuse anybody, but maybe that's next week's lesson. But anyway, we're out of time. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. <laughs> so uh, I guess you, we'll say a quick prayer and we'll be dismissed. Lord, thanks for, the, uh, thanks for giving us a good lesson today. Thanks for the examples. Just thanks, for, thanks for the things written in for our admonition in the Old Testament that we can use today. And we can see that the path that Israel went on was a wrong path, and we can recognize it in ourselves and in our churches. And I pray that you'll help us to be on the right path and help us to keep short accounts with you and stay right with you. And then give us a good rest of the service here. Give the, uh, the ones that are in Tennessee today a good service as well this morning and, and just set us all on the right path and keep us there. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.